Well, good evening. Uh, thank you all for coming this evening. I think you're going to find it to be a very interesting program uh, with the panelists that we have tonight. Uh, this is uh, really kind of a, another, another session of the same panelists plus an addition of one additional. But uh, I think it's going to be an interesting evening. Uh, this year, this past July, it was five years since uh, the United States uh, could send humans into space uh, when the shuttle landed back in 2011. And uh, fortunately, we've been able to uh, rely on our Russian colleagues and uh, send our astronauts to space. And uh, there is a plan afoot to have private companies take astronauts uh, to space, uh, probably within the next few years. And uh, we'll be relying on them to go into space. Uh, we are also, at the same time, building a very large rocket, the Space Launch System, and a capsule, a launch vehicle that really doesn't have firm requirements, and a capsule uh, that doesn't really have a firm destination. And as a matter of fact, we're building three capsules. Uh, we have uh, a capsule being built by Lockheed Martin, one by Boeing, and one by SpaceX. And of course, they're landing back in the water, much like we did 50 years ago. And none of the three will have any EVA capability or an ability to do uh, spacewalks. And I think uh, we have just proven with the assembly of the International Space Station the value and the importance of being able to do assembly in space. But that's a capability this country uh, has given up. And uh, in the foreseeable future, I don't see uh, it coming back. And that's unfortunate, because I think as we look to the architectures that will take us to Mars, having that capability to do assembly in space uh, is an important, an important and a necessary thing to have. But uh, it is unfortunately not there. <coughs> Back when we did this panel uh, three years ago, back in 2013, uh, there were two reports that had been published uh, looking at the human spaceflight program, one by the Space Foundation. Uh, they were published uh, in December 2012. The Space Foundation report uh, had some recommendations for NASA. Uh, they wanted them to shed some of their science and uh, other functions and uh, really a focus on exploration and uh, pioneering. The National Research Council had also done a report and was concerned that uh, without a lack of a national consensus on where NASA was going, uh, that was going to be affecting the budgeting and the planning for NASA. And then later on uh, in uh, June of 2014, uh, another committee, another research council committee headed by Mitch Daniels, the president of Purdue, published a report uh, that said pioneering in space, NASA's pathway to Mars. And uh, they came up with some specific recommendations, and I think some very good ones, and uh, pointed out that really, contrary to what uh, some people are thinking, Mars is still a long ways off. It's not as close as maybe some people think. Uh, but in view of all this and uh, the uncertainty really uh, with the space program and then with the, uh, uh, another election coming up, a presidential election coming up, we felt it would be well to have uh, our panel reconvene. And we wanted to add an additional member, Michael Limbeck, uh, who has some recent experience in private industry and uh, with private endeavors in space and also has a background with NASA. So uh, we have the group here tonight, and uh, we're going to have Mark Albrecht start it off. Mark uh, is, if you look in your program, has a great background. He was the executive secretary of the National Space Council under President George H.W. Bush and Vice President Quayle. Uh, he was a legislative ass assistant for security affairs to Senator Pete Wilson before he came into that position. Uh, he left uh, the government and went to SAIC and then became president of Lockheed Martin's International Launch System ser ser Services. So let me turn it over to Mark. All right. Thank you, George. <coughs> Thank you. 
Well, thank you, George, and it's great to be here again, and it's wonderful to be at beautiful Baker Institute and Rice University. Uh, I must say that the uh, buffet spread was spectacular, but having learned many years with uh, my wife who's in university, it's very dangerous to get near to a buffet table when there are college graduates, college students involved. So I exercised a little uh, discretion. They didn't seem to be so eager to get to the wine. I figured the seniors of the group uh, had their priorities in order. But it's beautiful, beautiful facility, and it's great to be here. And I'm so eager to hear from all of our colleagues. Um, we're at a very interesting period of time. And of all the things to talk about, George mentioned some of the programmatics, and I'm sure we'll get into that. Uh, all the issues that are potentially associated with uh, uh, accommodating what you could call commercial space, although there's a lot of dispute about what constitutes commercial. Um, I want to focus a little bit on just taking my short period of time, because I do want to hear what uh, our colleagues have to say, on describing to you what I think is the situation. And it's a dynamic in Washington, and it's one that I know well, and so I feel like I can tell you a little bit about it. You know all the pieces of it, but I want to tell you how I think it fits together. And that is that NASA has, over the last six years or so, maybe longer, it's really hard to say, engaged in a bit of a repetitive cycle. And the cycle has elements in it that cause it to move forward and circularize. And I want to walk through it. It doesn't have a particular beginning, and it certainly apparently doesn't have an end, but it goes on and on and on. So I'll pick a point in the cycle and start, but I don't want to imply that that is the start of the cycle. NASA takes on more and more activities. Many, many activities. Uh, you know, uh, everything from uh, more Earth science to the traditional exploration to launch to high-speed com high computing to hypersonics to, I suspect, I've even told the story several times, I'm sure there's stem cell research being done somewhere at some NASA center. People are giggling. They're probably already competing for resources about that. Um, it's just the it's one element of what's happening with NASA. And those pieces begin to grow constituencies. And like anything else, they get a little more next year than they had a little more last year. And so the top line at NASA becomes a, a top on a pressure cooker where there's more and more activities demanding more and more resources. So that cycle goes on. The top line gets adjusted, but minimally. It really isn't a big top line adjustments. In fact, the last year was a very favorable adjustment, almost 6% up, very, very good. But what I want you to understand is inside, the internal growth of so many disparate activities consume that quickly. Now, big projects like SLS and Orion and uh, Constellation, I mean, you can name them over time, um, those, those have a problem that when they get started, uh, there seems to be in the system a process by which their cost estimation, schedule estimation, technical difficulty estimation is optimistic. Um, <clears throat> There are other words, but optimistic. So as the cycle goes forward and there's growth from the bottom and new activities consuming new resources, some top line growth, but certainly not enough to accommodate it, the large initiatives start getting eroded from the bottom and their own overestimate, over optimistic estimate of what they will cost and how long they'll take um, begin to eat them. So the cycle, the wheel keeps turning, people do good work, things go along, there's a lot of observation, and then we have chains of, of administration. We have a change of administration, agnostic which one, would do anything. I mean, George and I were in the White House, so this is not a, um, a negative uh, event. But the first thing you do when you have some oversight of an agency or institution is you say, I'd like to do an independent review of the status of programs. I mean, I need to know where we are in order to know where we can go next. 
And what we get is a very predictable, any group you ask, it's not uh, a matter of choosing the group that gives you the answer. Literally anybody, the National Academy, Norm Augustine, anybody you want is gonna give you the obvious answer, which is the major programs are underfunded, they're behind schedule, and given the rollout and the layout of the budget we see in the future, they're very, very distant for accomplishment or even unexecutable. So, in, in, uh, in line with good government, they reform, restructure, and potentially start new programs. And those new programs have the same defects as the old programs. They're overly optimistically estimated, and we roll forward, and the wheel turns again and again and again. That's where we find ourselves. Now, I will say one thing before I, I stop. Having described this, this is the condition, and it goes on and on and on, and we're about to hit another turn of the wheel. Now, people are really smart. People who care about these institutions, who care about what they're doing, care about NASA, uh, are not immune or, or, to, to what's happening. So this time, we've tried something new. The Congress, which is certainly a participant in this process, and some of the interest groups have said, ah, we're going to have a presidential administration, change of administration. They're going to ask, what's the status of the programs we have? They're going to find what GAO, anybody you can trip over the bodies is going to tell you. And we're going to go through this cycle again. So we're going to interrupt that cycle. So we're going to interrupt that cycle by saying, we in the Congress, we're holding hands. This is a really good program. We've worked really, really hard. We've thought very hard about it. And all the compromises, et cetera, have been made. This is a program we do, don't do it this time, which is nice. And there are all kinds of letters and editorials saying, we finally have got it just about right. The problem is the physics just don't cooperate because any independent assessment of the current status of the program is going to find the same thing. Notwithstanding the wonderful letters from Congress and the wonderful letters from industry and people who care about the space program that says, let's not do that cycle again. It's a little bit like domestic abuse, you know, let, let's just not do this anymore. So I think we're at a precipice here. We've got some new roles and activities. There's a whole lot to talk about. Um, there are many challenges for NASA. Uh, one of the problems of, of the uh, institution that has become um, so... Uh, uh, I should say muscle bound by all the activities in it, the, the, the cycle I just described, is that we're now watching and the public are watching what appears to be the private sector, whatever you want to call it, leaping, bounding ahead of the government programs, which is going to begin to cause a confidence problem of maybe they know how to do it and the government, the institutions we know and love, like NASA, don't know how to do it. So this is going to be a huge new challenge to figure out how we either break this cycle, we change the cycle in an important way. Of course, there's always one way, which is to say we double the NASA budget. I, okay, and then a miracle happens. I don't think that one's gonna happen, but it, it could, that would solve the problem. Or uh, we're going to have more and more people saying, why aren't we facilitating and helping those people that seem to be doing things in leaps and bounds in a way that we simply can't do it. George pointed out access to space is a classic example. So a lot of issues, uh, a lot of um, uh, opportunities to excel, as they would say. And I'm eager to hear from our colleagues about it. I just wanted to talk about this one element. I'm sure in the Q&A we'll get to many, many more. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mark. Our second speaker is uh, Leroy Chow, an astronaut, and uh, Leroy has flown uh, three shuttle missions on Columbia Discovery and Endeavor. Uh, he's also commanded a space station uh, mission of six and a half months duration, and uh, he uh, did that from October 2004 to April of 2005. And uh, then in December of that year, he decided to uh, leave NASA and pursue uh, uh, private uh, pursuits. And uh, he is an adjunct professor here at Rice. Uh, he uh, also taught over at Louisiana State University. And uh, he also is chairman of the user panel for the National Space Biomedical Research Institute. Let me turn it over to Leroy.
Great. Well, thank you, George. Thanks. Uh, really uh, honored to be a part of this group again. Uh, I was honored three and a half years ago, so thank you for inviting me back. And uh, again, uh, just really great to see everyone here. And it's also great to see all the folks here. I want to uh, give a shout out to my mechanical engineering 592 students who showed up and, and maybe some of my junior and senior lab students. Uh, you'd all get credit for coming. I wanted to make sure we had some people here, although Mark kind of pointed out we did have food. And being a former grad student myself, I kind of remember that uh, that's a pretty big driver. Anyway, um, you know, three and a half years ago, we were here talking about this topic and, uh, you know, where, what has happened in that three and a half years. I think we've made some progress in some places. In other places, we haven't, disappointingly. Um, and so with the election cycle coming up, as, as Mark and George have both talked about, uh, there are big question marks about where we're going or where we even should be going. So I think, you know, what we talked about the last time and what is always on on the minds of everyone is there's the government program, you know, Orion, SLS, and exploration, which, uh, you know, some people see at odds with the commercial program. Okay, some people see it as, okay, the commercial program is making, you know, pretty impressive strides, frankly, but, you know, a lot of people see it as an either or, and I, I don't. I see them as kind of coupled together. We intentionally turned over uh, low Earth orbit to the commercial companies some years ago, starting first with cargo and now developing the capability with crew. And with some luck, uh, we will hopefully see the first flights of the commercial crewed spacecraft sometime in early 2018. Uh, shuttle, again, we don't need to talk too much about shuttle. My personal opinion, again, is that it was a mistake to retire shuttle when we did. In fact, um, uh, you know, I, I, it just kind of made me sad. And so I, I had never gone to see a shuttle in a museum yet until last week. Last week I had a, uh, I got to visit Discovery over at the Udvar Hazy uh, Museum. I'd never been there before. And uh, it was pretty neat seeing her after 16 years. But it's okay. So we won't talk about shuttle because that what's done is done. But um, you know, as far as the commercial and the the uh, the, the government program being separate, I, I don't like seeing when people think that it's one or the other. I think it was the right thing to do to turn Leo over to commercial because now that we've developed the capability, developed the technology, uh, you know, just just like a national airline. Airlines used to all be national. Now let's turn that over to the commercial guys. They can find efficiencies and and maybe do it a little bit more smoothly. The um, but the government's role is to push farther. <clears throat> Okay, and so to do that, we do have to have a spacecraft. We do have to have a rocket, and so uh, you know, SLS Orion has made progress. We've seen uh, we've seen some flight tests. We've seen some some static tests, and uh, you know, at least the hardware is still being built. Now, one aspect of this that uh, that we're going I'm sure we're all going to talk more about is the international one. Now, I have to admit, you know, when I was a younger person, uh, and, and I still don't really like politics, but as it, maybe maybe I'm just a little thick. It took me a while to to kind of finally come around to understand and accept that you know politics runs everything, right? All decisions are political, and and there will continue to be. Anytime you have people together, that's just what it is, and so. You know, the foreign or the, the international relations part of this cannot be understated. You know, the whole space race, the so-called space race that I grew up under, uh, that was all predicated on beating the Soviets into, you know, with technology uh, into the moon, right? And that wouldn't have happened without the politics. So, you know, when we talk about why do we have a space program? Well, there are a number of technical reasons why we have that, a number of important uh, re reasons for the United States, but don't discount the international one. And people point to our cooperation with Russia. I have to admit, when George opened it up to the Russians, or helped open it up to the Russians in the 90s, uh, I was a skeptic, having grown up during the, the, the Cold War. I didn't know what we were gonna get out of it because those guys, I was taught that those guys' stuff was all junk, you know, and, and, uh, and they were just gonna try to steal our secrets and all that, but in fact, it's turned out very well. And I think we certainly uh, can look back at history and see how we helped them quite a bit during their MIR program, and then help, they helped us uh, when we were down after the Columbia accident. So my point is that we should expand that cooperation because it's the politics that are going to drive this, right? And so we should include countries like China. And for those people who say, well, they're just trying to spy on us, they're going to steal our secrets, well, you know what? So are the Russians. They've been trying to spy on us. They've been spying on us for a number of decades. We've been spying on them. Everybody's spying on everyone, okay? And if we have 
have the right safeguards in place, and to my knowledge, there's been no, un, un, uh, you know, no, no um, improper transfer of technology in either direction with the Russians. Uh, why can't that work with China? And for people who say, well, you know, with Russia, why are we working with those guys? Look, look how bad they are. Look how bad our relations are. And so I would say, well, if we weren't working on ISS together, I think it'd be a lot worse. And at least we have that one thing that we have in common, a very visible civil project that we're working on together. Uh, at least we have that one place, uh, one common point where we can try to build on uh, to better our relations again. So, um, you know, everybody wants to go to the moon. And frankly, uh, Constellation, I was part of the Augustine Committee back in 2009, and Constellation, of course, was gonna take us back to the moon with a permanently crewed uh, human base there. The uh, program, frankly, had a lot of funding problems, had some pretty serious technical problems, and uh, you know, it probably was, uh, it's gonna be unpopular for me to say this with some of the folks in the room, but it probably was the right thing to do to cancel it. But it didn't mean that we had to not go to the moon. You know, and frankly, uh, you know, it came down to us on the committee not to talk too much about the moon because uh, there was no way that administration, this administration, was going to go there because it was W's program. Okay, and that's a pretty stupid reason not to go to the moon. And so I'm hopeful that with this election cycle, when we change, that maybe the moon will be a possibility again. Uh, not change total direction. We'll continue building Orion and SLS, and you know, we use that as, a, as an international destination. The Europeans have been talking to the Russians for a number of years now about putting astronauts and cosmonauts on the moon. China recently announced what had been an open secret that they plan to send their astronauts to the moon. Uh, you know, the United States, we are no longer have the luxury to say, well, we are the leaders in human space flight and we're gonna dictate what's gonna happen and you're all gonna come follow us. Uh, you know, these other people are developing their own capabilities now, partly because we don't, we haven't allowed some of these players to come in and work with us. So. As far as that goes, I, I'm hopeful that we can kind of, you know, with the next administration, no matter what happens, maybe things will get better. Of course, I thought that 10 years ago, and uh, it didn't get better. In fact, I think it got worse. Now, the other, another thing I want to talk just briefly about before turning it over to, to Joan is, you know, the, the part where the, uh, the commercial stuff, the really interesting is happening. There's some very big announcements in the last couple of weeks. Jeff Bezos announced a rocket that is bigger, gonna be bigger than the Saturn V. He announced his plan to kind of push humanity outwards into the universe. Uh, Elon Musk, in a somewhat different way, it's been no secret that he wants to colonize Mars, but now he's, you know, just last week announced at the IAC, of course, that he wants to send a million people to Mars over the next 40 or so years on vehicles that can carry 100 or 200 passengers. You know, that's pretty, that's kind of even beyond what I thought Elon was gonna, gonna announce. Now, what this, brings, what this brings us to, though, is an interesting possibility of some kind of a public and commercial cooperation on exploration. And so, uh, although it's natural to kind of look at them as separate and competitive, uh, these guys, I mean, he, Jeff Bezos, I mean, imagine this, he's been self-funding this Blue Origin for all these years, and he's continuing to self-fund this. You know, Elon Musk has self-funded SpaceX. Uh, he's frankly gotten a lot of money from the U.S. government, but he's gotten some pretty significant investors, in, including um, some very, very big, uh, you know, Fidelity and, and some others, big names that, uh, that have actually invested in his company. So I think it's exciting. I think we have an exciting future ahead. Um, it's all a little bit fuzzy how it's going to fit together, but all the elements are there. So I'm hopeful that with this new administration, hopefully we won't do go hard left rudder or hard right rudder. Uh, we need a little bit of consistency, but hopefully we can tweak that fit of how all this stuff goes together and really go and do something. Thank you. Thank you, Leroy. Our next speaker is Joan Johnson Fries. Joan is a professor at the Naval War College in Newport, Rhode Island. Uh, she's a former chair of the National Security Affairs Department at the uh, at the War College and uh, was a uh, professor in, uh, on the faculty of the Asian Pacific uh, Security, uh, Security Studies Center in uh, Honolulu and also on the faculty of the uh, University of Central Florida. She's the author of uh, two very excellent books, uh, Heavily Ambitions, uh, the America's uh, Quest to Dominate Space, and also Space as a Strategic Asset, and also she's written a book on uh, the Chinese space program. So let me turn it over to Joan.
Well, thank you to Mr. Abbey and for Rice University for including me in this very distinguished panel. When I considered the other people on the panel and their, uh, their, their positions, I thought, what can I add that's different? And given that I am not from Washington or from an area that is influenced by a, a NASA center, I thought what I might contribute is a, an outsider's perspective on space politics, what Leroy just referred to as perhaps unfortunately driving the train. Uh, I don't think the United States is in the same place it was four years ago regarding space, but I also think that the changes that have occurred in the U.S. space profile are largely because of the new space actors rather than anything to do with NASA or the government generally. Um, Charlie Bolden does a great presentation on the journey to Mars. I was very fortunate to host him at the Naval War College last year where he gave a barn burner presentation. But the American public's attention span doesn't reach to 2030. Right now we're having a really hard time reaching to November. <laughs> Um, but NASA is in many ways a phenomenal organization. Often it's the only DC bureaucracy that gives us any good news. And it does so with a budget of one half a percent of the federal budget, which is about the same amount of money as DOD spends on gas. I looked that up myself and I had somebody check it. Um, it's a bureaucracy where individuals can actually get something back. And I tell all my friends, go to the NASA website, get the videos, get the pictures, get the lesson plans, take advantage of your tax money. But the public perception of NASA has suffered considerably over the past several years, and I would say specifically since 2011 when the shuttle was retired. And for many years, I considered myself a NASA cheerleader, explaining to anyone who would listen that NASA was really caught between a rock and a hard place, trying to respond to the, the space spectaculars that the public expected and doing it basically underfunded by Congress. And I also pointed out or excused at times what I considered um, NASA's bureaucratic naivete um, because of its atypical birth as a bureaucracy that was from its beginning the golden child that was overfunded and not really learning to be the junkyard dog bureaucracy that prevails in Washington. More recently, however, and again, specifically since 2011, NASA seems to have become somewhat of a dysfunctional family, or at least a family, if not at war with itself, then having a lot of familial disagreements. Until 2011, I think, that NASA had a focus and a culture, and it was all built around the space station. And looking out in this particular audience, I think it's safe to say that you remember better than I that some people had 35-year careers that all focused around uh, the space shuttle. But when the George W. Bush administration, and in my humble opinion, it was the right decision, uh, decided to retire the shuttle and the beautiful bird flew for the last time, NASA seemed to go into mourning and many of the NASA employees with it, feeling lost. What do we do now? And here's where the politics comes in. Though the decision had been made already to go forward with Orion, politics being what they were, NASA was embargoed from talking about that. And that was so that the White House and members of Congress could all figure out how to put their stamp on the new program to make it different in there so that they could take credit for it. And that created the perception that NASA had basically closed up shop. Nature abhors a vacuum, and workforces hate uncertainty. Um, especially an organization with centers with different emphases and different cultures, and that can quickly become dysfunctional. My perspective on that comes from several different angles and kind of pieces of outsider evidence. First, there was the destination, no destination, asteroid moves, Mar uh, Mars debate, with the 2009 Augustine Committee report giving lots of, of options. And in the spirit of full disclosure, I will uh, admit that I have been among those who said, don't race back to the moon because it's going to inevitably be couched as a race with China. And it's a race that China could this time win. And you don't want to, you don't want to set that up. Um, but some within NASA 
adamantly rejected for technical or, or cultural reasons, the asteroid plan or the Mars plan, for what, again, I admit I've called terminal nostalgia for returning to the moon. Um, the extent of the feelings consequent to that debate, I think, is reflected in discussions that I have with people in Washington and around the country where we just speculate on who might be the NAS next NASA administrator. And what I get back to me is a lot of conversation is, well, what side of the debate were they on? Because that seems to play, the politics plays into it. Before coming here today, for the first time, I was also contacted by several individuals all urging me to, to base my remarks based on uh, answering certain questions and all substantively sound, but most of them requiring a dissertation as an answer, um, or to re redress particular study results, all advocating a position. There's all these different positions that seem to be in competition. And I think after the shuttle program ended, the human exploration program, the space station office, and much to everybody's surprise, the science directorate all seemed to be vying for public attention, or as perhaps as Mark said, everybody was willing to take on what do you want us to do now? So I think NASA in many ways and against its own cultural instincts, seems to have become another bureaucracy with all the foibles and interagency bickering that often plague bureaucracies. Meanwhile, the new space companies, the SpaceX, the Big, Big Glow, the Virgin Galactic, are taking all kinds of risks formerly taken by NASA and considered part of American exceptionalism that are now considered to politically, economically, technically risky. New space companies are announcing plans with timelines and goals far more daring than NASA. I ran into a friend of mine um, over the summer in Haifa, Pete Warden, and he was telling me about plans, the Breakthrough Initiative plans to go to Alpha Centauri. And I said, Pete, this is amazing. And he said, well, do you want to see the spacecraft? And I said, yeah, do you have a picture? And he said, no, but I've got a model. And he held this up. This is the model. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. I said, oh, can I have it? And he said, yeah, I have two. You can have one. So this is my best show and tell ever. <laughs> but to my mind, the role of the private sector is good. Space is finally developing as both a geographic area and an area of industrial development in a normal way with the government handing off roles and expectation to the private sector and the private sector striving to develop business plans that allow them to continue. So NASA is on a path to Mars, though not all NASA employees seem to be either on the path or at least see the path in the same way. NASA, I don't think, isn't lost in space, but it has lost the luster of being an edgy, risk-taking, forward-leaning organization, unlike other government bureaucracies, and has become a more typical government organization, for better or for worse. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Joan, for your observations. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Neil Lane. Uh, Neil uh, uh, served as a, the science assistant for science to the President of the United States, President Clinton, and was also director of the White House Office of Science and Technology. And uh, prior to that time, was director of the National Science Foundation and on the National Science Board. Uh, prior to that, he was a uh, provost and a professor here at Rice. And today, he is a fellow here at the Baker Institute, and again, a professor in physics and astronomy, and the Malcolm uh, Gillis Professor at Rice University. Thank you very much, George. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm not a space expert, everybody knows. I'm a guy who's had a dose of space policy in uh, years that I worked in the Clinton administration. At the earlier Lost in Space panel, 
Uh, I talked a little bit about how how it is giving advice to the president, how the White House works, as if as if I knew or anybody else knows. Today, I want to do something different. I want to talk a little bit about what kind of advice I think the next science advisor <clears throat> might give <clears throat> to the next president. <clears throat> And when I was thinking about today's panel, George brought to my attention an article I hadn't seen. It's called A First Space Brief to the New President. It was written by John Horak, uh, recently appointed to the inaugural Neil Armstrong Chair of Aerospace Policy at Ohio uh, State. I don't know John Horak, <clears throat> but I agree with many of the things that he has to say. So what I'm going to do, a little unfair to John, pick his six recommendations as just ways to organize my comments. <clears throat> so I'm not going to try to describe what John's rationale was for each of these recommendations. I encourage you, if you're interested, have a look at uh, his, you can find his paper on his LinkedIn website. I'm just going to organize around uh, his recommendations. That'll give you some sense of at least what my personal view is and what his is. Before I do that, I want to preface with three, three points. First, about science. Uh, NASA's um, and NSF's contributions to astronomy and planetary science have been extraordinary. Uh, and will continue to be, in my view. I think the American people are not going to be well served if we let uh, 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 exploration plans or any other uh, activities of the relevant agencies get in the way of science. Science really is about the future of the country. The far future, science is about innovation. It is about civilizations, and it needs to be protected in my personal view. So the next president and members of Congress really need to understand the complexity of this word balance when you apply it to an agency like uh, NASA. I'm very concerned about this, particularly with Congress, because when we lose people like Barbara Mikulski stepping down, <clears throat> extraordinary champion for science and space, we might not have all agreed with every single decision Senator Mikulski made. I certainly didn't. But it's hard to find, hard pressed to find a stronger advocate for science and space. There aren't many there. And frankly, I'm uh, very concerned about that. Second, on international cooperation. Science advances by bringing together the best minds, best people, wherever they are in the world. It's kind of a no-brainer for science. <clears throat> but we've learned, and it's already been commented on, that in exploration, international cooperation is also extremely important. And that needs to include countries like China and India. Uh, it's just possible that cooperation in space could actually alleviate some of the dangerous tensions going on here on Earth. Third, transparency and accountability. American people seem not to trust much of anything the federal government says or does these days. And rather than wring our hands, we need to work much harder to ensure that uh, what we're doing makes sense, that the NASA plans are understood, and the same for other agencies. They're affordable. Federal officials and contractors are held accountable uh, for their performance, and the people are getting what they want and pay for with their taxes. Good news is people feel pretty good about NASA and the space program. I would say not extraordinarily enthusiastic, and they think they're paying a lot of money for it, which they aren't, uh, to the extent that they believe they are. And, uh, uh, so you have goodwill to start with, and I think if we just can uh, exercise a little uh, better judgment in terms of communication <clears throat> and accountability, that'll serve us well. So quickly now about John's recommendations. John Horak again. These are my words. Treat U.S. federal expenditures on space as investments. Well, I think there are many things the federal government does that should be treated as investments. And many of us have toyed with the idea of even a, a capital budget for the federal expenditures. And that's been suggested uh, for a long time, and it's even been rolled out there and beaten back. Uh, I find Congress not very interested in that. Members of Congress like to use the appropriation process. They feel it helps them get elected. And anything uh, along the lines of a capital budget, I think, would get in the way of that. Uh, second, restore the lunar surface as our next waypoint for human explorations. Well, today there's a lot of international entrance has already been described in, in having a presence on the moon. I think we don't want to look down from lunar orbit and watch 
China and India and, and Europe and other, uh, other parts of the world starting to establish uh, missions there, even if they're small ones, while we're uh, going around and around in the cyclic process that's already been described, uh, applied to the agency itself. <clears throat> I believe that the U.S. is serious about sending women and men on exploration missions someday to Mars or planetary moons or other objects, places in uh, the solar system. We need to learn a lot more about living and working for long periods of time in harsh environments. We've been to the moon, but we didn't stay very long. So the U.S. really ought to consider, uh, in my view, leading international expeditions back to the moon and to other bodies in the solar system, perhaps eventually Mars, and work with other countries to, along, uh, to ensure free access to space and uh, cooperation in the use of space, everything in it. It means, it could mean then significantly redirecting uh, the NASA policies right now. It's gonna be a hard sell, uh, maybe uh, certainly to Congress, and maybe to the public, but if it's explained, that people understand uh, in a much better way than they do already uh, what, the, what the direction of the space program really is, I think the new president could find this a real opportunity for leadership. Third, step up our international leadership and collaboration. It's already been talked about. I certainly agree and have commented on that uh, already. But unfortunately, the majority in Congress right now does not encourage much cooperation with China. And in technical areas, it's, get, it's increasingly difficult to cooperate with anybody because of export controls, and in the case of space technologies, ITAR, which is a particularly difficult barrier. Fourth, extend the life of the International Space Station. It's a controversial issue. Uh, I believe that the U.S. plans to send people into space, repeating what I said earlier, uh, there are sound arguments for extending the life of the station. It's been a successful partnership, a model for future undertakings. We have much more to learn about how the human body responds to long periods living in space, while continuing to do research that could bear fruit. Now, we've phased out the space station without having a replacement. You've already heard the opinion it was a mistake. If we decommission the space station without having a replacement for that, it's a different entity, but it's another big hole in the U.S. space program. And then I don't think anybody is going to say the U.S. is a world leader in space. Five, support commercial crew and cargo to the International Space Station while finishing the operating, uh, while finish, uh, finishing and operating the civilian space launch system and Orion. Well, these are two different things. Uh, comments have already been made about uh, Leo and, and increasingly involving commercial uh, companies in that endeavor, and that certainly seems uh, important policy, in my view, to continue. I think the advisor might tell the president that. Uh, but as Eric Berger said about um, the international, about SLS, uh, in an article that maybe you, maybe you read in Ars Technica, uh, he wrote a column entitled, How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Big $60 Billion NASA Rocket, which he subtitled, okay, maybe we don't love the massive SLS, but we are learning to live with it. I think Eric's describing the political realities of the situation. In the meantime, companies like SpaceX, Blue Origin, that have already been mentioned, others have big ambitions, they're doing innovative things, and the president should be advised that there's a window, we don't know how long, but a window of opportunity to put in place new kinds of government university, government industry, partnerships, and we have already begun in that direction. There are serious budget and political issues that would have to be addressed here, but it's a leadership opportunity for the president. And six, finally, Consider the question of whether NASA should be an independent agency. Oh, I love this. This is reorganizing government. I mean, it's so much fun <laughs> to think about. But, you know, we need to be careful what we wish for in this regard. Uh, it is true that uh, their cabinet-level agencies, organizations, have certain advantages. They do have more direct access to the president. The president generally pays more attention to problems of big cabinet-level uh, department runs into than, than other so-called independent agencies. Um, on the other hand, when you start down the road of reorganizing, putting NASA together with NOAA and NIST and the Commerce Department or into the Department of Transportation or bundling it with NSF in some totally new department, 
it's very difficult to predict where that's all going to end up, and we have data to show how previous efforts along those lines have gone. Finally, what will the president do? Well, I have no idea, of course, what the president will do. I'm simply suggesting some things that I think the next science advisor, and I don't know who that will be either. I can tell you it will not be me, but it's going to be somebody, somebody quite good, I'm sure. And uh, uh, so kinds of things that they might recommend to the president. But I think a compelling goal for the U.S. space program that keeps American people excited and garners continuing political support that has confounded presidents since Kennedy, you could argue. It's not that each president didn't worry about this and didn't try some things. It just hasn't quite clicked. So the next president could change that trend, and in my opinion, it would be, should be among the president's top priorities. Science advisor working with the agency heads, department heads, and director of OMB should lay out options for the next president in the first 100 days that will then result in the president's, the administration's position on the space program. John Horak concludes with something I'll just read. He says, space is not a luxury, not a campaign tool, nor is it a nice to have for the uh, country. Space is an essential function of government in the 21st century. The new administration has an obligation to steward these space investments and activities to secure the optimal long-term return for the United States. Thank you. Thank you very much, Neil. Our next speaker is uh, Michael Lembeck. Michael is president of uh, CEP Stone here in Houston. Uh, he uh, worked in NASA and was uh, involved in the formulation of uh, the uh, vision uh, for exploration that George W. Bush had and going back to the moon. Uh, he left NASA and has been in industry and has a, a great deal of association with a lot of the commercial concepts that are being undertaken right now. So let me turn it over to Michael. Thank you, George. Um, I know a lot of us have been around Mr. Abbey here for a number of years, and we've all probably had our George moments. Uh, one of the things you probably don't know is how much George really gives back to the community still in dealing with school kids, bringing international school kids over here, in fact, to appreciate the space program and uh, even this opportunity for me today. So I want to thank you, George, for that. So some 60 years ago, uh, NASA was formed primarily to extend and exploit the uh, benefits of outer space for the country. And at that time, none of this existed. We had to start from scratch, build everything up, uh, invent a lot of it, including operations. Along the way, we uh, had the Mercury program got us started, then the Apollo program developed, but there was a lot of little things in between that still needed to be taken care of before we go to the moon. And Gemini was injected into the program. So NASA learned early on, you need base hits, not home runs, to get to where you want to go. And that's kind of a lesson learned, and that's what I'd like to talk about this afternoon, primarily, is some of the lessons learned that we can see in the growing partnership between the commercial industry and NASA. So, as I mentioned, over time, operations has sort of become a focus for NASA. And back in 2004, when I was at NASA headquarters, we started to chip away at that. We started to consider how could we relinquish some of the work that's being done in LEO to commercial companies. And the COTS program is formed, which ultimately is now several companies taking cargo to the space station. Within the next year or two, we will start to see the next chip taken away where co crew will be handled by commercial entities moving to the space station. And that'll be a, a really big step forward to relieve some of the resources that NASA spends today uh, in that area. So where will we be about 10 years from now? Well, hopefully we'll take another step and we'll start to move away to commercial LEO uh, habitats. We'll, we'll continue to uh, supply the space station and take crew there. And maybe tourism will start to develop. But in general, we'll continue to d develop these things where we can t chip away a little bit at what NASA does to allow NASA to go do the things we'd really like it to do, which is to explore deeper into the solar system. 
And we'll, after we achieve that goal, we're going to have some architectural choices to make, and we've talked about some of the policy choices that are going to go along with them, whether to go back to the moon, go direct to Mars, or so forth. But I'd like to come back to the minute and, and address how those choices might affect this commercial to government balance. One thing's for certain. You know, NASA is 50 years old, and we're starting to see the migration of the talent and the knowledge base that was in, inherent in NASA to the commercial industry. A lot of the commercial providers today have senior mentors that are helping them out. I cut my teeth in one of the first commercial companies here, Space Industries, was Max Vigier's company after he left NASA. And 20 years ago, we thought we had the bull by the tail developing all sorts of products for space. Today, I see a lot of the same arguments being made for the market that's out there, yet this market doesn't seem to develop. And if we look at a lot of these commercial folks that are active today, they're building one thing, rockets. Every major provider that we talked about, Virgin Galactic, Blue Origin, SpaceX, Orbital, all build rockets. And so a lot of the resources we have today are being spent in that direction and not on the things that fly necessarily on top of rockets. Now there's a lot of talk about payloads and you'll see a lot of uh, Silicon Valley types and Seattle types talking about the next generation of CubeSats doing all sorts of wonderful things for us. But many of the issues we have today are the same that were there 20 years ago and we haven't really knocked them out yet. We still don't have high frequency to orbit. We don't have large volumes to orbit. And we don't have the ability to just frequently access it. So a lot of companies that would like to develop things there that need large volumes, high frequencies, and reliable transportation have shied away from it over the last 20 years. I think John Elbon said it best at a hearing on the, on the Hill a couple of months ago, said uh, if the number doesn't have a B behind it when talking about the dollars, a Boeing company isn't interested in it. And so neither will be a Johnson & Johnson or a Pfizer. We need to have that basic, reliable, fast, large volume transportation in order to enable a lot of these commercial items. NASA itself also has some say in how this happens. To date, NASA has primarily worked in pr making a large number of suppliers uh, come about. They have the knobs for demand in their hands, but they haven't really touched them yet. We could be flying much more frequently to the station with cargo missions. We could be turning over the cargo up there more frequently and, and taking advantage of that research space that we have today. So these are things that could be addressed that haven't been yet, and the policy actually will have a, a play in the near future on how we go about balancing commercial with government demands. So one of the future objectives for uh, NASA itself then, after you relieve this LEO space from it, is where do we go next? And of course the moon is talked about, as several of the panelists have already mentioned. Uh, one of the problems is that the moon can be a dead end as well. And I know that there are several in NASA that have taken that, that point to heart, that if we stop there, we may never make it to Mars. But I think there are several ways that, uh, I, by the way, I was also called by several of my colleagues this week and told, don't get into the technical stuff, just talk policy if you can. And, and, but, but I think it's time for the nerds to meet with the policy wonks and lay out that path forward for how we do this. Space is an ocean, and you're not gonna go across an ocean in a rowboat. And chemical propulsion is a rowboat. So one of the things the government can do is to turn to high-speed propulsion to allow us to get to where we want to go. Todd May, just a couple of weeks ago in Huntsville, gave a, the center director for Marshall gave a little speech saying that nuclear thermal propulsion could be developed for single billions of dollars. That is a great thing for the government to do. That is something commercial can't do. And could you imagine what Elon's plans would be if he could put his capsule on top of one of those high-speed rockets? A perfect government commercial partnership. So I just leave that with you to think about is the, the role for government is to do the things that the commercial folks can't do, the big dollar investments, the facilities, the infrastructure that's required to do it. And then the commercial folks can take advantage of that. There can be partnerships. The government doesn't have to compete with commercial to get there. You can actually lay it out. One of the things back in 2004 that we talked about at headquarters was having a national team, you know, eliminate some of the competition, start to earmark certain pieces of the puzzle to different companies and, and elements of government, and then put that together so that we can achieve our goals instead of having eight companies building rockets. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Michael. Our next speaker is uh, Jean Levy. Uh, Jean uh, served as provost at uh, Rice University from 2000 to 2010. Uh, and prior to that time, he uh, was the dean of the College of Science at uh, University of Arizona and head of planetary science and uh, also director of the Lunar and Planetary uh, Laboratory at University of Arizona. And today he is uh, the Andrew, uh, Andrew uh, Hill Buchanan uh, professor of uh, astrophysics here at Rice. Thank you. I think Donald Trump's not here, so I can drink before I speak without fear of ridicule. Um, in 1976, in, in the famous book, Richard Dawkins, uh, the prominent <clears throat> evolutionary biologist and popular author, coined a new word. The word was meme. A meme is a social and cultural analog of a gene, uh, the unit of biological heredity. Analogously, the meme is described as a cultural heritable unit representing an idea. Uh, in the process of cultural evolution, the culture, of course, is built of ideas. In the process of cultural evolution, memes are passed and spread among individuals, groups, and generations. Memes propagate socially instead of sexually. I don't mean to imply that sex is not social, but you know what I mean. Uh, some memes dominate for a long time. Some become extinct quickly, and others fade slowly. It's an interesting accident of history uh, that the very idea of the meme appeared at roughly the same time that a persistent meme appeared in our culture, our space program culture, one that is highly pertinent to this evening's discussion. It happened like this. The Apollo program, which ran from the early 1960s to the early 1970s, culminated in a series of piloted flights to the moon and, man and manned landings. These occurred over a four-year span from 1968 to 1972 and came to an end with Apollo 17 in 1972. By any measure, the Apollo program was a monumental historic achievement. I don't need to rehearse that for this group, I'm sure. Uh, you're all familiar with the reasons why Apollo was such an extraordinary accomplishment for technical, cultural, social, and political reasons, among others. An accomplishment that will surely continue to ring throughout the ages of future history. The meme that grew out of Apollo and continues to uh, go something, went something like this. Uh, by the way, this is a meme that has two parts, a premise and a punchline. First, the premise. The United States led the world in the human accomplishment of truly extraordinary importance, recognized the world over, and sure to live in history yet to come as one, as one of the defining, perhaps the defining, uh, event of our age. And to be sure, I think no rational thinking person could deny at least the approximate truth of, and significance of that premise. Then comes the punchline. Punchline asserts that the United States dropped the ball. The US failed to continue on and to establish permanent human habitation of the moon, failed to take the next steps by building elaborate colonies from which human presence could spread to make the American people at least the salient of an extraterrestrial civilization. This meme says, this the meme says, represents a profound failure of American vision and American leadership. There are two main branches of affirmative reaction to this chain of, to this meme of this claim of failed leadership. One branch holds that we should leapfrog the moon and go on to initiate human exploration leading to the permanent habitation of the planet Mars. The other branch of reaction holds that we should restore our attention to the moon and finish the job, and by the way, go to Mars too that we should be working to establish outposts and colonies and build up a human population on the moon for whatever purpose. At this point within NASA and under federal policy for NASA 
to the extent that there is a federal policy for NASA, the aspirational Marsh Martians seem to ha be winning the day. We, meaning the population of onlookers, among whom I include myself, are being entertained by the vision of human expeditions to Mars in the 2030s. There are certain ambiguities about what that means, whether it means a short foray of the order of a month or a long foray to the surface of the order of a year. Uh, there aren't a lot of in-betweens that are feasibly attractive, uh, owing to the orbital mechanics. Either of these involves formidable infra infrastructure and associated costs, at, as of course does the moon. Just to get to the surface of Mars intact with a large enough uh, infrastructure uh, to live and get back off is a very formidable undertaking. The daunting nature of the challenges uh, has moved some to argue that instead of sending people to the Martian surface, we should send people to uh, parking orbits around Mars from which they could use joystick consoles to remotely operate mobile robots on the surface of Mars with low latency, with short latency times. Altogether, it seems to me that the spaceflight program, insofar as it engages the idea of peopled spaceflight, has been preoccupied with finding a way to recover the fumbled ball of the 1970s. I think there's merit in considering this from another angle. Perhaps the ball wasn't fumbled at all. Perhaps there simply was no compelling reason to advance human habitation of the moon, and even less compelling reason uh, to pursue human exploration of Mars at this time. Perhaps the special benefits are not only not obvious, but not present. Perhaps the most effective use of resources available for space exploration and science is, is not a new Apollo writ large, initiating deep space uh, human presence and habitation. Perhaps it would be better to maximally exploit what humans can accomplish in near-Earth space with expanding infrastructure and to explore deep space with increasingly capable robotics, remote sensing, in situ and in situ analysis driven by and helping to drive rapidly advancing uh, capabilities in robotics and artificial intelligence. Perhaps that would be a wiser policy and engender a more sensible and more productive program. In fact, I'll go a step further. I will tell you that I definitely believe that would be a wiser policy and that it would engender a more sensible and more productive program. While this is a large subject, and it has, in my view, been uh, far too little debated uh, these nearly 50 years, while the program has stumbled forward, or stumbled around, however you see it, unconvincingly. While it has been stumbling, uh, why has it been stumbling? I believe it's been stumbling because there's far too little conviction supporting uh, the NASA program, as it is currently defined, and a substantial measure of persistent disbelief in the reality and the promise. That may not be a permanent condition. I suspect it's not a permanent condition. It may be that as we explore and as we learn, preferably in my view with the use of robotics and the, and the attendant technologies, as our technological capabilities and society develop and grow larger and more capacious, there may come a time when reasons emerge why colonizing the moon or, or sending people to Mars to explore and, haps, and perhaps eventually colonize, there may come a time when that is ripe. But I think, realistically, that time is not now. Let me bring my initial remarks to a close with the observation that I've made before, an observation I've made before. Societies have a host of reasons for supporting research and exploration, and it behooves us to think broadly what those are and about how we respond to those. I have long argued that our space program, among its other attributes, is one of the ways that our contemporary society challenges itself, flexes its creative energies and muscles in the hope that meeting those challenges will advance our capabilities in ways that are beneficial to us here living on Earth, even as we expand our sphere of knowledge and intimacy into the cosmos. As I once said to a congressional study panel that I, uh, uh, I, I believe uh, U.S. space and human exploration advances our capabilities mainly in ways that do not address our needs on the Earth, that human exploration does not. Uh, 
Uh, I know that's a contentious issue, and it may be contentious this evening, but I will insist that it's a matter of balance, not a matter of total black or total white. As I argued in the congressional panel 25 years ago, I'm almost embarrassed to say, uh, what will significantly advance life on Earth as well as activities in space uh, and what will advance U.S. competitiveness is the development of better robotics, better remote manipulation, remote and in-situ sensing and artificial intelligence. I don't think that the technologies that are primarily attendant to keeping people alive and functioning and healthy in deep space, uh, like very reliable zero-gravity toilets are in the same category as the things that our society needs the most. Thanks. Well, thank you, Gene. Our next speaker is uh, John Logsdon. Uh, John was uh, the founding director of the Space Policy Institute at George Washington University. Uh, he served in that capacity from 1987 to 2008. And uh, he's a professor emeritus in uh, international politic, political and international affairs at George Washington today. He's also the author of two very good books, uh, John F. Kennedy and the Race to the Moon and after Apollo, uh, Richard Nixon and the American Space Program. And he tells me he's now working on a third book and he can tell you more about that. Thank you, George. And like everybody else, thanks for getting this group together. I had to be coerced to come down here. It was a combination of Mr. Abbey and my wife said, you gotta go and here I am. Uh, I'm not sure I thank you for making me last, though, uh, and particularly after Jane Levy, who has put a challenge to, I think, probably 99% of the people in this room are who are firmly committed to the idea of human exploration beyond Earth orbit, uh, and I'm one of those. And, but, you know, Jane's ideas are very provocative. We maybe should have another panel to say, stay in Leo forever. I don't like it, though. <laughs> Let me read you two quotes. One, the civil, U.S. civil space program stands at a crossroads. NASA and the space program are without clear purpose or direction. Second quote, the U.S. civilian space program has moved forward for more than 30 years without a guiding vision. Those support the hypothesis of the title of this uh, uh, session, Lost in Space, which I don't like. Uh, the first of the quotes was from the transition team uh, advising Ronald Reagan in January of 1980, uh, team headed by George Lowe, as a matter of fact. The second was in the Columbia Accident Investigation Board report in 2003. So the idea that we're drifting, that we don't have a clear purpose, has been around a long time. And it's, why is that? Uh, I think part of it is the fortunate slash unfortunate heritage of Apollo that Apollo created a model of what a space program should be. Firm deadline, uh, a, a, a achievable goal, and a commitment of resources adequate to achieve that goal. Well, sure, we'd all like that, but that was a one-time thing. It's not gonna happen again. And so setting another Apollo-like space program as the ideal and anything less than that uh, as unsatisfactory, I think will not get us anywhere. Are we really lost in space? Do we have a clear direction? I mean, after all, the destination has been specified, Mars orbit by the 2030s with landing to follow. Uh, there is a schedule, uh, a set of intermediate milestones, some of which are explicit, some of which are implied. If OMB would let NASA talk about its plans, you, I mean, Bill Gerstenmaier and his team certainly have a set of milestones uh, beyond EM1 and EM2 that are step-by-step -step, 
uh, uh, architecture, if you wish, uh, to, to the surface of Mars. You have people, uh, not people, but people, but companies like Lockheed Martin with a, a very creative proposal for a Mars base camp, uh, which is the orbiting uh, with robotic operation. What do we, what would satisfy the critics? And what, what would be not lost in space? What, what is there missing uh, that um, uh, it, uh, would catalyze a, a, a firm consensus so that the next president could come in and say, yeah, we know what we're doing, we know where we're going, let's get on with it. Uh, certainly uh, uh, NASA and, and the Congress are trying to keep a, a level of sustainability in the current program. I think the argument's really about the current program, its viability, its wisdom, whether we've made the right hardware choices, whether it is wise to skip the moon on the way out, uh, whether the SLS is the right design, whether we've invested enough in uh, a very old fashioned, like 2010 word, game changing technology. Uh, and more than anything else, can we do what we hope to do with the resources that society is likely to provide? Is there such a mismatch between uh, uh, ambitions and, and uh, program requirements? And, and I think that that mismatch goes back a long way. I think we are, I should say, in a convergence of a lot of historical trends. I'm supposed to be a historian, although I never had a history course in my life. Uh, uh, but we, you know, we inherit the aura of what a space program should look like from John Kennedy. We also inherit the infrastructure for doing large-scale programs from Apollo. We inherit the decisions by Richard Nixon not to continue uh, to use that infrastructure for uh, continued exploration, uh, something I call in, in the After Apollo book, the Nixon Doctrine, which basically says space is no longer special. It has to compete for resources with all the other things that are important to us. Well, that competition goes on every year in the budget cycle, both in the executive and, and in the Congress. And the answer that NASA is going to get about a half of 1%, we might not like, but you know, if, if you believe in functional democracy, that's the answer that's come out of the system now for almost 30 years. Uh, and, and at some point, the community has to recognize that, I think, and, 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 uh, and deal with it, basically. And I think the primary heritage of Ronald Reagan, as, as, as George said, I'm, I'm just starting the writing of a book, which I think I will call Ronald Reagan and the Space Frontier. Uh, I think the thing that's lasted till now uh, from the Reagan administration is the opening to the private sector, uh, encouraging private sector involvement in space, which was before that had not happened. Uh, uh, Michael mentioned the industrial space facility, I and mean, that, was, that was part of a Reagan administration uh, initiative that uh, NASA was successful in shooting down. I don't think NASA can shoot down private investments anymore. There is one elephant in the room, it's been mentioned a couple of times, which is the International Space Station. I think on anticipated budgets, we cannot conduct a, a, a uh, high quality exploration program and have a government funded uh, International Space Station. At some point, there has to be either a transition to primary, private sector lead in the station or what? Uh, and that's a really tough question that nobody wants to talk about. Uh, but the next president, I think, really will have to uh, address what is the future of station beyond 2024. Um, because it's, say, well, we certainly will never get to Mars at the current funding levels adjusted for inflation and continue to operate station into the indefinite future. What happens? All right. We're, <laughs> with a change in uh, administrations. Uh, it will clearly be up to the next president uh, to accept, modify, or reject 
the concept journey to Mars and all the underpinnings that NASA uh, and its contractors have worked so hard and I think so well uh, to, to sketch out. I think the idea that we don't know what we're doing, uh, it, it, you know, it's almost an insult to Bill Gerstenmaier and his uh, uh, NASA and industry team. Uh, we've got a plan and, and, and lots of people have, have uh, worked very hard to make that plan technically attractive and more or less affordable. Um, if you've listened carefully to Charlie Bolden in the last couple of years, you see Charlie under the constraints he has to operate on, back, not kind of backing up, but uh, saying the U.S. is interested in returning to the moon. Uh, it's just not ready to build the lander. Uh, and, and it can contribute two of the three major elements to a lunar architecture with a big rocket uh, and a cislunar uh, presence. So if somebody, Europe, I saw last week, I'll come back to what last week is about, uh, a, a suggestion of, of European-Russian cooperation in a lunar lander. There have been cooperation, discussion of European-Japanese cooperation. China does have plans after 2030 to get people to the moon. There ought to be some way of stirring that mix into a viable international program. Seems to me that largest failure of the Obama administration, in my view, is the lack of international leadership in terms of uh, forging an exploratory coalition. I was at the International Astronautical Congress last week in Guadalajara. Fair number of conversations with international colleagues saying, we can't do this. The United States still has to be the leader uh, among government space programs. And there have been several missed opportunities where Mr. Obama could have uh, and purposely did not lay out the idea of let's join together as President Reagan did in 84 with the space station. Uh, and, and hopefully the next president will reverse that. The other experience at the International Astronautical Congress was the Elon Musk phenomenon. I don't know what to make of that. I mean, do we need rock stars to motivate uh, public engagement? And, uh, it, it, you had to be there to see these hour and a half lines of thousands of people to get into the auditorium, rushing the stage, knocking people over. Uh, it, you know, th this crowd has never experienced. Well, Mary Lynn was there, but uh, uh, you know, that was strange. How Elon has constructed this thing called Elon. Uh, uh, I think it, it, it is fascinating. And what does it tell us about? Uh, uh, public engagement with space. Um, a couple of people said, well, we've got to keep people excited. Space as entertainment, I think, is a, sh is a dead end. We've got to keep people engaged with the perception that what is happening in space is valuable. If, if you try breads and circuses, uh, constant excitement, I don't think it will get anywhere. We have to, I think, in this community, figure out the relationship between new space, uh, private sector, uh, the, the Blue Origins of the world, the, the uh, SpaceX's of the world, and all the other uh, uh, organizations interested, particularly in human spaceflight, to get a program sorted out. So I, I don't think we're lost. I think we're at a point where a lot of historical trends have converged to a, uh, a place where we need a lot of sorting and creativity and, and forging of new relationships. And hopefully that will happen uh, as the next president, whoever she may be. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, 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 takes office. Uh, it, it, it should be an interesting time. Thank you all. Well, thank you, John. I mentioned uh, when I was making the introduction, I mentioned the three reports that have been done uh, in the past about NASA and the human spaceflight program. 
And the most recent one I mentioned was uh, the one that Mitch Daniels chaired, Pioneering Space, NASA's Next Steps on the Pathway to Mars. And I thought what he said in his report was very interesting. To continue on the present course is to invite <coughs> failure, disillusionment, and the loss of longstanding international perception that human spaceflight is something the United States does best. Uh, none of our panelists commented on that, and uh, I'm going to give you all an opportunity to comment on each other's comments and maybe also comment on that. Mark? Oh, wow. Okay. Um, well, I won't take a great uh, deal of time. Um, I guess I was uh, impressed by what I heard with um, how, it, how unaspirational it really is. I mean, you have all these people with all these different uh, perspectives and point of views. Um, it's, it's, to my mind, extraordinary that uh, there's a sort of a settling uh, that, that seems to have set in with the space program. Um, I disagree with a number of things said, but one most recently with John and Elon, um, I, you know, I think uh, the fact of the matter is that we have ceased to capture the imagination of people, particularly young people, about what space is. We've become un, uh, um, audacious in what we're trying to do. And I think it's, it's disappointing people, it's boring people. And when Elon says, I'm gonna send 100 people to Mars, that's, that's exciting. And uh, it's not just that. You know, many of us in this room have spent 30 years trying to get reusables into the space business because we know it's the lever to reducing the access to space, cost of the ac access to space. As somebody pointed out, you know, we've got seven or eight companies and all they're doing is building rockets. Well, it's because that's the lever. It's getting out of this gravity well is the problem. And we've spent, I mean, I was in government, we've spent billions, tens of billions of dollars with all kinds of concepts for reusability. And these people, these companies, seem to, uh, in the space of five years, have achieved it. Two different different companies, two different concepts, and it works. It, it makes the government seem boring, slow, plotting, and so I, I think that uh, they don't need the money. That's the other thing now, of course, Elon does. We all know that, um, but some of the others might not. And uh, the idea that, that and, and how, how to accommodate, so I have two quick comments and I'm passing along. Um, how do we accommodate this, this new phenomenon? We being those inside the government industrial complex who have spent so much of our careers trying to move this ball forward and done so joyfully. Um, you've heard ample uh, explanations of why it's bogged down. I mean, how does it unbog? Well, we could have a whole panel of how to unbog it, but we're bogged. And um, and so these uh, these private uh, firms, you know, they're creatively using government money. Elon has figured out a way to take enormous sums of government money with no little or no oversight or insight, and he's run with that ball. And and you know, as Dan Golden said at another conference we were at, God love Elon Musk. I mean, he figured out a way to do it. <clears throat> The other thing is what John mentioned is space station. Space station is the poster child of the bog. It's the poster child of the bog because as we've heard from other panelists, we lost the space shuttle. That was the beginning of the bog. But if we didn't get the space shuttle out of the way, there was absolutely no resources to do anything else. And the problem with space station is beginning to eat the lunch of NASA given all the other mouths that need to be fed. There's only one way out. And it's the way most of us, many of us, all will see it. More money for NASA, double the NASA budget. It's just not going to happen. So the question is, is $19 billion enough to do audacious, interesting uh, uh, things in space? The answer, in my, my humble opinion, absolutely. Plenty of money. It's there, it just has to be mined and put in a direction. And there are a lot of elements of, of doing that. So uh, those are my two uh, reactions to the comment. Uh, 
Well, yeah, this has certainly been very interesting and thought-provoking, uh, certainly uh, taking into consideration some of the things that the other panelists said and respectfully disagreeing on, on some of their other points. Uh, I'd like to kind of start my comment to, with George's uh, question, you know, do I agree with this? Basically, if I can paraphrase, that we're losing, uh, if we lose our space program, we're losing soft power, and I think that's absolutely true. I think the whole reason, uh, kind of along this thesis that I talked about, about politics running everything, the whole reason a country gets into a human spaceflight program is for national prestige, is for uh, projecting soft power. And so uh, I think it's vital to our national interest to continue a very <coughs> robust spaceflight program and a robust human spaceflight program. Uh, I think the unmanned stuff, the uh, uh, fantastic results coming back from New Horizons, uh, from the Rosetta and Filet missions, I mean, just fantastic, wonderful stuff. Uh, but uh, we identify with humans being there, and that's when we, and you don't, you don't you're not able to project that same uh, image of soft power uh, with unmanned programs only. Um, but to, to kind of talk a little bit more specifically, I think we lost a lot, frankly, when we retired the shuttle. I respectfully dis disagreeing with Joan, uh, because from the political standpoint, okay, we can't launch astronauts into space anymore. We just can't, and we haven't been able to since 2011. And so arguably, we've kind of had a diminishment, not kind of, we have had a pretty significant diminishment. And as far as a Mars program, um, I, I have to disagree a little bit with John. We don't have a Mars program. We have this vague idea that sometime in the 2030s we might go, but there's certainly been no commitment of funding. Uh, there may be an, uh, notional ideas of milestones, but they can't be backed up because there have been no, no funding levels committed to in the out years to go and, and do that. Um, and then finally, let's see, what was I going to comment on? The, um, Oh, sure. Maybe it'll come back. But anyway, uh, you know, my, my point is that I think, I think we do have to continue with this very robust uh, idea, or how do we get back this idea of a robust human spaceflight program in the United States? I think we're the natural leaders to take us back to the moon. Oh, I remember what it was. Uh, but to, to Mark's comment here about the, uh, you know, hey, we've got plenty of money, got $19 billion, and so we should just spend it judiciously. Well, the assumption there, I think the problem with that is the assumption there is if we, if we cut out space station, if, you know, we already stop shuttle, if we cut out space station, that that money's still going to be there, and we're going to be able to spend it on whatever we want. And I don't think that's the case. You know, there's there's something to be said for, yeah, if we do go to the moon, it's going to delay our, our Mars trip. But then people say, that's therefore, we shouldn't go back to the moon, even though there are a lot of uh, scientific and operational reasons to do that before we go to Mars. Uh, but on the other hand, I, I think it's dangerous to assume that if we, uh, if we cut everything else out and just say we're going straight to Mars or something like that, that the funding will be there. Thank you. Go. Um, at the Naval War College, I teach strategy. And as my fellow panel members were talking, I kept trying in my mind to fit their comments into kind of a strategy diagram. And when Don, John talked about um, do, we, do we have a match between what we want to do and the money we have to do it, that kind of put it together for me in my little, in my head, my, in my diagram. That if I were teaching this in class, I would say we have a strategy misalignment. We have these big goals, and we only have enough money to do them if we rob Peter to pay Paul. We have to shut down shuttle to do something else, but then we can't get to the space station. But if we don't shut down space station, then we can't get to Mars. And this, to me, just presents a picture of, of strategy misalignment. So how do we get it under alignment? Well, there's been a lot of talk about partnerships, and I think there are lots of opportunity for partnerships. But for NASA, that also comes with risk. NASA developing technology to hand off to Elon Musk or somebody else makes NASA boring. It doesn't, it's handing off the pizzazz, and that pizzazz does have a lot of soft power. I think we missed a huge, the United States missed a huge opportunity for international leadership by not partnering specifically with China to go to the, back to the moon, because then it wouldn't have been a race. It would have been a sign of international leadership. But that's not a presidential prerogative. That's being held up by just very few members, but very few vocal and powerful members of Congress. So until Congress gets on board with the need for international cooperation and the recognition of soft power that goes along with leadership, we're going to keep going in the cycles that, that Mark talks about. There's another elephant in the room. And in a moment of shameless self-promotion, I'm going to mention the book I have coming out in November. <laughs> 
It's called space warfare in the 21st century. And the elephant in the room is that there is a great big military space program that has very clear focus right now to prepare for, to fight and win a space war. And um, there is, it's, all, it's anticipated. Uh, you may have seen General Hyten on 60 Minutes about a year ago and talking about the Chinese. The Chinese are doing nothing that we haven't done and done better in long ago. Uh, they've done nothing to, uh, I often say, the United States talks about it wants to work with responsible spacefaring nations. Well, what would that look like? Are we the model? If it is, they can have a big military space program, they can have ASATs, they can have a lot of things. But we don't know. But my point is, there is a military space program that's going on that could have very, very significant effects on what we want to do on the civil and commercial side. And in this book, I talk about there's opportunities to tamp down some of the security dilemmas that are being created on the military side by increased cooperation on the civil side. So I think there's, uh, there's lots of pieces to this puzzle that, that need to be looked at as one, and that's the commercial, the civil, the military, and the international, and the soft power that goes along with it. I'll stop there. Well, thank you very much, John. Yeah. Well, I wish I had wisdom to compare to what we've already heard. I don't have that. I agree with the points that have been made. Um, the new president is going to come in uh, with a lot of uh, uh, policy issues already in place and in motion, and she or he may uh, will have to choose uh, pri what the priorities are really going to be. It takes a lot of time, energy, trade-offs to work with the Congress uh, to make some of these things happen, and those trade-offs going all on all the time. Fewer in recent years than in previous years, just because of the way politics is going uh, with a polarized Congress. So not a lot is happening there. But let us be optimistic and feel that uh, in the uh, next Congress and the next president that those opportunities will somehow present themselves. It's really going to take leadership on the part of the president. It's going to take leadership in Congress. I keep thinking, given all the horrible things that have happened politically, the time is right. Everybody will come together and decide much more is going to be accomplished working together than, than going down these uh, aimless uh, roads. So, so in space, of course, I don't know how high a priority it's going to be. In the case of one candidate, uh, Secretary Hillary Clinton, I, have, I have, think I have better understanding of what she, I certainly know what she thinks about science and about space because I had a chance to work with her in the White House. She's always been very pro-science and always very and very interested in the space program, has said so. Not a lot of specifics have been laid out by either candidate uh, with regard to what they might do with the space program because it's complicated. And there are jobs involved and there are all kinds of uh, uh, potential uh, problems associated with decisions that will be made. So it's not surprising that we haven't heard a lot of those specifics and therefore we might think we don't know what's going to happen. Um, I believe that uh, uh, the opportunity is there, that the points that have already been made about the importance of U.S. leadership, those will appeal to the new president, whoever that ends up being. And there's just a chance that, especially with the uh, new players and uh, the opportunity to work with uh, other countries, uh, I think there's just a chance that it will happen. I'm not optimistic about international cooperation with China just because the, uh, the views in many, of many people in Congress are so strong and these people are likely to still be in powerful positions. So it's going to be very hard, but you can't give it up. I think the arguments that, that Joan just made about the value of diplomacy on that front uh, to perhaps counter some of the more dangerous uh, threats that we feel on the other side is, is something that the president can understand. So I would encourage uh, the new science advisor to take those issues uh, to the president early, very early, like now, before the election. If those people are known by the candidate, if those people are there, 
uh, to have those discussions, it's not too early to begin to get the attention of, uh, of whoever might be the next president. Thank you very much, Michael. Michael? I think the thing we've heard a lot about is it's real easy to point to our leadership and say something's not working right there, but I think that's a cop-out. If uh, you look back to the history of the Johnson Space Center back around 1996 or so, and you put together a list of all of the laboratories, the programs, the projects, the facilities that were available there during that time, it'd fill up a whole page. If you look at it today, everything that was on that page in 96 has now come down to one item, and that's operations. Everything else has migrated out of Houston. <clears throat> If we can't build the wall around Houston to maintain our technical leadership here, how can we convince the rest of the country to do so and have a viable space program? It's really clear that we need to figure out in our own backyard, how do we convince our leadership in Congress to protect our interests and assets right here in our own hometown before we can start preaching to other folks? And the other congressional delegations around the country have been very effective in doing that. So I think that's one of the things we have to start to correct is right here in River City, Space City, is to figure out what we want to do, how to do it, get the leadership together, and then go convey that to the people that are making the policy decisions. Thank you, Michael. So there are a couple of, of items that have come up. I'll, I'll make maybe a brief comment about a few. Um, one, uh, George asked about the uh, reaction to the Mitch Daniels report. Um, I think that we don't pay enough attention to that report. Uh, it was a realistic report. Uh, it, uh, it, it understands uh, the, uh, the challenges and the difficulties and the magnitude of, uh, of the programs that it, that it reviewed at a level that I think does not infuse most of the public discussion. Uh, we, it, it is easy to uh, underestimate uh, the, particularly the infrastructure challenges of, of, of a, a mission or a program of missions to Mars. Uh, I think that, that, that we are smoking if, if we think that we have budgets that are uh, within that realm, uh, at least with a, with a program of a finite lifetime. Uh, and that, 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 that reality uh, has to inform our thinking about this, uh, about, about the, all of these issues. Uh, because I think that uh, conversations that transcend reality are not particularly useful uh, as, as, national, as conversations about national programs. Uh, so while we're talking about unreality, let me make a comment about Elon Musk. Uh, when, 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 one, when, when one tries to parse the excitement that surrounds Elon Musk uh, with the clear lack of excitement that surrounds the NASA program, let's realize that Elon Musk is an unconstrained entity. He can promise anything. Right? He doesn't actually have to have a budget or a plan to get there. I mean, the notion that we're going to be, uh, w w that we are within any sight of 10 to the 3, 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6 people going to Mars, that's not even a conversation worth having. And so, you know, if, if people gather like moths around a light bulb, uh, a conversation that has no uh, imminent re reality, you know, that, that, that's, that's not exciting, that's a problem. Because that's, that's driving the thinking and driving the expectations in a direction that's not going to crystallize and it's not going to be realized. And I think we need to be, real, be realistic about that. Um, I'm going to take the opportunity to, to disagree with my friend Leroy. I think that we, we have to uh, ask ourselves whether uh, human exploration is going to continue to be the be all and end all of excitement. Uh, around our space activities in the United States and in the world. Uh, I would remind you that by the time the Apollo program ended, I don't think anyone was watching it. I, I was gripped by the first uh, expedition to the lunar surface, and I was gripped by Apollo 13. But I was unaware 
of the, the missions that were taking place to the moon. And I'm not alone. I mean, I, nobody I knew was paying attention. And so these are very, very exciting, important things, but they are not <laughs> gripping the public imagination broadly the way we think. And I don't think they're gripping the public imagination uh, any, more, any more intently or broadly than the Hubble Space Telescope and the uh, Curiosity mission on the surface of Mars uh, and all of the other exciting things that we, that we can do uh, if, we, if we put our, our attention and our resources into a, into a rationally focused and realistic program, not a program that imagines that we're going to have an ever-expanding human presence into space. These are big distances, and these are difficult things, and these are difficult environments. Uh, and, and it would be interesting to have a, a realistic conversation about those aspirations and the challenges that those aspirations pose, and then ask ourselves how to focus, how to focus the future in, in NASA's program. Thank you, Jane. <laughs> so thank you very much.